Welcome everyone. So good afternoon, good morning. Welcome to everyone that's joining us for our first 2021 Pride event. My name is Kyle Hartman and I'm the current chair of the Rutgers University Rainbow Alumni League. I also work for the university as a public relations specialist for the Equine Science Center. On behalf of the Rutgers University Alumni Association and the Rutgers University Rainbow Alumni League, I thank you for joining us. Today, I'm pleased to welcome you to Queer Sex Ed, Queering Sexual Health and Wellness, featuring Dr. Francesca Maresca. Dr. Maresca joined Rutgers University in 2001 and now receives health services, CAPS, HOPE, and HOPE at the Rutgers University New Brunswick campus. She is responsible for leading efforts to create a culture of well being at Rutgers University through assessment, planning, implementing innovative interventions, and evaluating success. She is an adjunct instructor for the Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy and the Graduate School of Education. Her expertise is college health and wellness, sexual health, mental health, suicide awareness, and LGBTQ plus health. Dr. Maresca co-chairs the university's health and wellness committee and co-leads the Rutgers University JED campus initiative. If you have any questions for Dr. Maresca, please submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to accommodate as many of these questions as possible. If at any time you have technical issues, please use the chat box to communicate with us and we will work to get that fixed. It is now my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Maresca. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. I appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody who made the time in their day to be with us here today. So as Kyle said, uh, my name is Francesca Maresca. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I took a piece, peek at the participant list and I see people I know, which is always exciting. So hi, Lynn and hi, Leo. I'm glad you could be here with us today. Um, and you should feel free to, to um, drop any information in the chat if I get anything wrong or if I miss anything when I'm talking about Rutgers Student Health. I was super excited to be asked to speak to you all um, today. Obviously, it's Pride. Um, this is, this is a, a big month for any of us who identify anywhere along the LGBTQIA plus spectrum. Um, I personally think any day of the year is good to be proud. Um, but it's always nice to have a month where we really are taking a, um, a moment to celebrate who we are as a community, because we are a vast and diverse community. And uh, to quote President Holloway, um, for those of us at Rutgers, I always like to believe we are part of a beloved community as well. So today we are going to be talking about um, queering sexual health and wellness. And what does this mean? So I'm going to tell you a story. And um, Lynn has probably heard this story because I've, I've talked about this um, at some of our meetings within Rutgers Student Health. A long, long time ago, a very young lesbian went to her very first gynecologist appointment, and that was me. And I was very lucky. I grew up in a household where we talked about these things. It wasn't anything secretive or, you know, where we had to cover our mouth and, and kind of whisper about sexual health. And my mom had passed away already, and um, I was... Mm, 17 or 18 years old, maybe. I was 18. My mom had passed away. Okay. And um, I had been having issues. I was having issues with my menstrual cycle. I wasn't getting my period and I didn't know what to do. And I said something at the dinner table and my father being my dad basically turned around to my sister and said, she needs to go to the gynecologist to make this happen. My sister was all 18 months older than me. And my sister said, well, you could see mine. And hers was in New York City on the Upper East Side. And that just felt really, overwhelmed, felt really overwhelming to me. So I asked one of my friends, who do you go to? And none of them had had a GYN appointment yet. So one of them said, I'll ask my mom. So uh, she asked her mother who her gynecologist was. And I went to my very first appointment alone. I had absolutely no idea what to expect. Even though my sister had been seeing a gynecologist, I didn't know what happened inside the exam room. And I went in and I'm, I'm sitting on the exam table dressed in my paper towel, um, freezing because it was, it was chilly, it was air conditioned and waiting. And the, um, the uh, nurse came in to, take my, to do my history, basically. So keep in mind, now I'm, I'm, I'm already naked and dressed in paper towel and I'm scared. And she's asking me all of these questions, you know, family history, this and that. And then her next question was, um, what kind of birth control do you use? Not are you sexually active, but what kind of birth control do you use? So I answered honestly, and I said, none. And she went, what? And I said, well, I don't need to use birth control. 
And in a voice that I am convinced had like a secret megaphone attached to it, she said, oh my God, you're a virgin. And I was convinced everybody in the waiting room heard this. And no, um, honestly, I was not a virgin, but my partner was another female, was another woman. So um, immediately I said, nothing in my lip. Because I thought to myself, this isn't a place where I'm going to come out to this person who made an assumption about me right off the bat. Now, obviously I'm older, right? This is many decades ago, but it really shaped how I saw my medical interactions and my clinician. And the, the uh, doctor came in, did the exam, um, said, I could put you on the pill, but if, you know, if you're not having sex, I'm not going to bother doing that. And that was it. And I didn't even understand the pill. I, did, I went to an all-girl Catholic high school. So that should tell you what my sex education looked like within and there. And I left. And I never went back to a gynecologist for six or seven more years. And I was sexually active in that time. Um, so I should have been accessing my health care. But our first encounter, or maybe even our 10, or the messages we receive from other people, such as our friends or our family, um, really influence how we think about our health and wellness on a very deep level, um, and not just going and getting our exams. That's not the only thing that we really need to think about, but how we think about ourselves, how we think about our sexual behaviors, how we think about risk. Um, it might have shame attached to it homophobia might be involved. Now, I have no idea how those clinicians would have reacted if I had come out at that moment. It might've been like, okay, now we get it kind of thing. But I wasn't in a place at 18 years old to have that conversation. Um, every single one of us has multiple identities. Every single one of us. And we can't take just one of them, right? I can't just take lesbian me and put me someplace and separate that out from me as I identify as a female, as, as a person who walks around with a vagina. Um, I can't take that out from my whiteness, um, from my socioeconomic status. Everything is all meshed together. Um, so when we look at our health and wellness, we have to look at all of us as well. So I do want you to know, years later, many years later, I was um, undergoing fertility treatments. Um, my now ex-partner and I had decided we were going to try, wait, me, I was going to try to get pregnant. And I was sitting um, in a space in this very large practice waiting for my, um, my phlebotomist. It was always blood work. And um, two of the, um, two or three of the health tax nurses were having the conversation. And one of them said, um, her daughter really wanted to wear this rainbow belt. She got this really cool rainbow belt. And another one turned around and said, oh no, you can't let her do that because if you let her wear a rainbow belt, people are gonna think she's gay. And this was about 20 something years after my initial um, encounter in the healthcare setting. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, first of all, you are talking in front of somebody who does identify as part of the LGBTQIA plus community. And second of all, a rainbow belt means a rainbow belt. And I was really, um, again, in that position, but here's where things changed. Um, when I was done with my appointment, I went up to the front desk and I complained. And I told them that this was unacceptable. And that in a healthcare setting, when you don't know who your patients are, when you don't know who your staff is, you don't say those things and you don't have those conversations. And I strongly suggested that they get some training on board. Um, so for me, health and wellness um, for our community, it is vital, is vital. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit because some of you had submitted questions ahead of time. So basically what it did is I looked at all those questions and um, I put together today's presentations, but of course, you can put more questions um, into the Q&A or um, into the uh, chat, wherever. I think Q&A is where it's supposed to go, and I will do my best to answer them. So for some of you, I don't know when you graduated from Rutgers or the last time it was that you accessed health in one of our student health centers. And a lot has changed. Um, so first of all, names and intake forms, just so you know. Um, uh, with the registrar's office, the student, a student can actually put in a preferred name. But when we first see a student, if they don't do that, we're going to get the name um, in our system that a student is registered with. But a student can then tell us what name they would like us to use for them, okay? Um, we worked very hard on our intake form, on our personal health history forms, et cetera. We worked with the Center for Social Justice and LGBTQ Communities to make sure that our demographic information was inclusive that we are asking people about how they identify in the most inclusive way possible. That we're not just saying, you know, male, female, 
uh, that we're not just saying um, heterosexual, lesbian, gay, bisexual kind of thing. We have a full range of choices so that people hopefully will feel that they see themselves represented on these forms um, and are able to answer them um, in their most authentic way possible. Um, we um, want everybody to feel safe and welcome in all of our spaces. So we have been um, uh, asking staff, everybody in medical to attend what we call safer space training, again, through the Center for Social Justice and LGBTQ Communities. So if anybody is here from there today, thank you so much for that training you do provide for us. Um, we do provide comprehensive care for students who would like to um, undergo gender affirming care, um, but we also do provide comprehensive care for students who identify anywhere along the LGBTQIA plus spectrum as well. Um, our staff are aware of the services that we offer. So they know that we are seeing students with a full range of gender identities and expressions and the full range of sexual orientation. Um, and they, they know about it and they are well equipped to work with people coming from different identities. Um, we um, do a whole bunch of stuff now around gender affirming care. Um, you know, way, way back in the day, and I'm talking like 20 years ago when I first started at Rutgers, we were not doing this. But first of all, if you do have the student health insurance, um, it does cover gender affirming services up to and including surgery. Um, we can provide referrals um, to our transgender community for a whole range of things, whether it be surgery, speech training, laser hair removal, et cetera. Um, and our clinicians often will talk to people in the trans community to make sure we're getting, um, getting some feedback on people and knowing where's the best place for me to refer somebody? Have you had a good experience with this particular um, provider, et cetera? Um, always know that anytime we work with insurance, and this is more a statement about the state of insurance in this country, there's always going to be a bureaucracy to deal with. We do try to make that as easy as possible for students, um, and we will work with you and help you, but we know that the insurance hoops, we're going to be jumping through them as well. So I just wanted you to know this is what's happening at Rutgers Student Health at this point in time. Okay. So somebody had also asked, um, about sexually transmitted infections and the ones that you know somebody might have to worry about um, as, as somebody who's part of the community. It's not who we are, it is what we do that puts us at risk. So when I'm walking through students through HIV testing, which we also offer, we have rapid result HIV testing. It's actually offered through health outreach, promotion, and education. So one little uh, finger prick and 20 minutes later, you will have a result. Um, we do a risk assessment and we ask a whole bunch of invasive questions. And I, I absolutely want people to know this, um, but here's the thing, HIV testing should be offered to everyone. Um, according to the CDC, if you were between the ages of 13 and 65 years of age, and if you've ever been sexually active, you should be offered an HIV test. And I'm curious, how many of you have ever been offered an HIV test in your standard healthcare practices? Um, whether it's your primary care physician, whether it's your um, GYN, if you utilize one. Um, I've never been offered one in my healthcare setting. Um, and I'm out to my clinicians um, and I'm always curious about why. Why are you not telling me that I should have an HIV test? Um, so what, what are we doing? Are we having unprotected sex? And so when I'm talking about unprotected sex, I am talking about anal, vaginal and oral sex, okay? I'm also talking about what I call intimate, sustained, skin-to-skin -skin contact, because newsflash, some STIs are transmitted just through intimate, sustained, skin-to-skin -skin contact, no penetration required. Herpes, HPV can be transmitted this way. So again, it's not about what part of my body is either being um, penetrated by somebody else or what part I'm penetrating somebody with. Um, it's really about this full range of activity. So we need to think about what we're doing and whether or not it's protected. So protected can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Is there latex of some sort involved, such as what we call a standard condom, an external condom, a male condom? Um, is that between me and somebody else's body? Um, am I using the internal condom, which sometimes we call the reality, or it used to be known as the female condom? Is that being used? Is there a dental dam? Um, is something covering somebody's genitals or their anus before it is touched by somebody else's mouth? Um, that's protected sex. And I know for many of us, we might be engaging in sex at all different varying levels. 
of um, protection or not. But also involved in that is communication. Am I communicating with my partner? Have I talked about SVI testing? When have I been tested? What have I been tested for? Um, and just so you know, um, in the whole world of SVI testing, it's not like I go give a vial of blood and it gets shipped off somewhere and it gets tested for a full panel of sexually transmitted infections. That's not how it works. Um, some are tested using swabs, some are tested using urine samples, some are tested using blood draws, some are diagnosed upon visual examination, meaning somebody walks into an exam room and um, they say, you know, I have this itchy, bumpy thing somewhere on my genitals and I don't know where it is. And a clinician looks at it and goes, oh, that might be a herpes one, a herpes bump. That might be HPV. That might be a war. Um, and then further testing may follow after that. Um, so STI prevention has to be a whole bunch of different things for us. And I will tell you, and I'm going to speak directly to anybody who identifies um, as having a vagina and having sex with somebody else who has a vagina, or you identify as a lesbian or female loving something. That is not a giant condom over us, okay? We can still get sexually transmitted infections. Lesbians have been often left out of the conversations around STIs and HIV. We are not immune. We are not protected. And some of us have sex with people who have a penis, okay? So it's not really about who am I having sex with and what body parts they are, but it's the fact that I am sexually active and I might be put at risk because my partner is infected. Most STIs can be transmitted through oral sex. A lot of people don't think about that. STIs can be transmitted by sharing sex toys. Um, when it comes to sex toys, you get what you pay for. Okay, so if you buy something that costs $9.95, you've got a $9.95 sex toy. If you buy one that costs $40 or $50, you've probably got a better quality sex toy, but it should also come with instructions on how to clean it. Because if you use that sex toy and you're switching it between yourself and another partner or a partners, and it has been inserted in anybody's body, it needs to be cleaned before it goes to the next person, or you need to put a condom over it to make sure that we're not swapping anything between our partners. And here's the thing, if I could see you all in a room, which I can't see you, I'm sorry, but if I asked you all, how many of you had comprehensive sexuality education anywhere in your K-12 education that included conversations like this, I might see one or two hands. And that is part of the issue for us, especially if we were um, coming into ourselves and coming in recognizing our sexual orientation and maybe as young as middle school and high school, is that the sex education we received didn't speak to us. The sex education we received talked about how not to get pregnant and how bad it would be if we did. So it was really the biology of reproduction and that is not sex education. So nobody taught us how to have these conversations with our partners. Um, nobody taught us how to talk about protection. Nobody taught us that maybe as somebody who was with somebody else who had the exact same body parts as we do, what that means in terms of sexually transmitted infections. Um, and they also, we maybe didn't absorb a lot around contraception. Did you know that young lesbians and, and bisexual young women are one of the highest risk groups for unintentional pregnancy? And part of that is because sometimes it's about engaging in behaviors that are high risk. Um, sometimes the high sexual orientation, um, thinking this doesn't apply to me because I'm never going to get pregnant kind of thing. So we're not providing comprehensive sex ed. And depending on your age and where you grew up and your school district, we'll, um, we'll decide whether or not you got comprehensive sex education. Okay. So somebody also submitted a question about hormones and safer sex and contraception. Um, and I am glad that I know there are clinicians because if I do say anything wrong, because I am not a medical doctor, I am a doctor of letters kind of thing. Um, if you are undergoing gender affirming therapies that involve um, hormones, um, you do need to uh, think about hormonal contraception. So if you have family risk factors for certain cancers, uh, specifically breast cancers, and you are, um, and you are using hormones, there might be some issues that you need to think about. Um, we also need to think about what we call like adjacent health behaviors. Um, if you smoke um, and then there's risk factors in your family for breast cancers and now you are taking estrogen 
and perhaps um, before your gender affirming their um, gender affirming health care um, or during it, you are somebody who who previously identified as male or had a penis. Um, you do need to think about bringing estrogen into your body if you have family um, family histories of breast cancer. Um, because it, it can have an impact on you. There's also um, family histories of stroke and blood clot that you need to think about when it comes to hormonal therapies. Um, so that's the family history is really important. Um, you know, for, for somebody of my age, you know, I, I had a family where we knew what everybody had. Um, everybody talked about all these things, but we didn't always have details. Um, and even when I, you know, when I'm talking to students and I'm talking about family history and hormonal contraception, you know, if if your grandma unfortunately had a stroke when she was 84 years old, um, it's, it's sad and awful and difficult, but not highly unusual in that age group. If you find out that someone in your family, um, your aunts, your grandparents, um, or your mom or your dad or somebody where there's history of blood clots that were diagnosed much earlier, 30s, 40s, 50s, people had strokes in those earlier ages, those are family histories that clinicians need to know about. So talk to your family if you can. Get a comprehensive family history because when you go in and you see a clinician of any type, of any type, they're going to collect your family history and it's important um, because there are things that run in families and it's always good if your clinicians know about this. Um, and that includes things like prior surgeries, et cetera. Um, when I worked at FIT, um, it was a fascinating, fascinating institute of technology, amazing school, amazingly talented um, uh, students. 80% of our population identified as female and presented as female. And our clinicians got really frustrated um, because they would uh, have some of our, young, our students come in and they would say, have you ever had surgery? And they're like, no, 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 no. And then they would be doing exams and realize that they had had breast augmentation. Um, and breast augmentation is surgery, um, but they weren't disclosing that. Um, any medications you're taking, please disclose. Um, when I talk about behavioral risk factors, are you using recreational drugs? Um, your clinician, especially if you are in um, gender affirming care, your clinician needs to know about this. Um, they need to know about any medications you're taking it. So whether it's an over-the-counter, whether it's a prescription medication, whether it's, um, like I said, any recreational use of drugs, they do need to know about it. It's the last thing we want is for things to start in, um, interacting in the wrong way. And then we need to look at our own behavioral risk, risk factors. Um, and I say this knowing that we are in a society that doesn't necessarily value us as part of the LGBTQIA community. So sometimes our behavioral risk factors are a function of the larger system of homophobia, um, transphobia um, that, that we have grown up in and that we live in. So we might be doing things um, that are not the, our best choices because um, they're coping mechanisms. So again, um, are we utilizing um, alcohol or other drugs um, because we're experiencing emotional difficulties? Um, so we need to talk to, we need to tell our healthcare provider this. And it might mean needing to see a mental health care provider or finding something to help with our emotional and our mental wellness. Um, or if we are using um, drugs of some sort, are we injecting them? Um, if we are injecting uh, drugs, are we making sure that we are using clean works when we're injecting so we can reduce our risk of HIV transmission as well as hepatitis B transmission? Um, are, we having, um, are we having sex with more than one partner? Nothing wrong with that, but it depends on how we're doing it too. So if we're having sex with more than one partner, are we using safer sex practices when we do this? Or is it all unprotected sex? Because that does put us at um, higher risk. So if you're somebody who has a vagina and you're having more than one partner and you're not using any type of consistent contraception, then we are at risk for an unintentional pregnancy, which obviously has a whole boatload of stuff that comes along with it. So these are the types of things that we do need to think about. So finding LGBTQ uh, plus inclusive healthcare, there's lots of places. Um, first of all, word of mouth. If you have a clinician that you really like, um, whether it's your primary health care provider, um, I don't care if it's your podiatrist, um, your orthopedist, your, um, your GYN, whoever it might be, but if you're happy with them and somebody comes to you and says, you know, I've really been looking for somebody, tell them, I love my health care provider and this is why. Um, 
I feel like I've had really good care with them, et cetera. If you feel you don't have anybody to ask or you haven't gotten good referrals, there's online places you can look. So there's the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association. I know their name is limiting, I get it, um, but this is, this is how they are branded and how they are known at this point. They actually offer a provider directory and it lists providers who are welcoming to the LGBTQIA community and knowledge about our unique healthcare needs, okay? And our concerns. Um, anybody who's listed in the GLMA has to um, affirm their commitment to creating a welcome, um, a welcoming environment for anybody in the LGBTQIA community. Um, so there's there's a two things that have to be done. They have to do it and they have to reaffirm their commitment on a regular basis. There's also the National LGBT Health Education Center. Now this is really for healthcare providers who are interested in becoming better, right? They want to better meet the needs of our community um, and they have lots of great free comprehensive resources for LGBTQIA uh, folks. Um, and this includes free webinars, lists of national health initiatives, and even hotlines. So it's just a general, really good resource. Um, there is stuff, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I did that thing. I scrolled, never scroll. Okay, okay. Um, there is also the um, center link, and this is a database. And it has information on LGBTQIA plus community centers all around the world. So if you enter your information, it will find the nearest community center to you. So again, I don't know where people are tuning in from today. For all I know, you are coming to me from Iowa, um, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, et cetera. But maybe you're relocating, right? You've graduated, you got the awesome job, but it means now you have to relocate to a new state and you have to get established and find community. So your community centers are a great place to start. Um, and quite often, they will have names of uh, healthcare providers who can provide really good, inclusive healthcare for you. Um, and they have um, a provider hotline as well. Okay. Um, so then there's the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. And I did not know this existed until a couple of days ago, so I was kind of excited about it. Um, they will provide, um, they have an online provider directory that can help people find transgender affirming providers. You just have to enter the information of where you live and the type of healthcare that you are looking for, um, and they will provide a list of providers for you. So I think that's really great, especially now, um, uh, you know, in our COVID remote environment, a lot of people did a lot of relocating. A lot of companies are saying, hey, you know what? We're giving up our brick and mortar building because we have been able to be successful in the remote environment. So a lot of people are saying, hey, I don't have to live within commuting distance of my business anymore, of where I work. Maybe now's the time I'm going to relocate to that beautiful beachfront community I've always been dreaming about. Um, or I'm going to go off into the mountains as long as I could get good internet, but I am going to have to find community and healthcare. Care Dash is really interesting. Um, it's actually a place where people can find healthcare providers, but they've actually added an option for healthcare providers to indicate if they are LGBTQIA friendly, um, whether or not they are a transgender safe space or both. And then finally, One Medical is a national primary healthcare provider um, that offers practitioners who are experts in LGBTQIA healthcare concerns. So we have lots of places that we can search if we're not in our, um, in our familiar environments. But if you're in any one of these areas, um, we do have the Proud Center at Robert Wood Johnson Somerset. This is new, a new initiative. It's only a couple of years old, but it is a full primary health care facility. Um, and they also offer mental health care and the full spectrum of care as well. And it is local to this uh, Middlesex County. If you are a New York person or a New York City adjacent person, Callum Ward Health Center is amazing. Um, it was one of the very first places I volunteered way back when, when their physical location was on the third floor of the um, Lesbian Gay Community Center down in Chelsea in New York City. And they've been offering fantastic care for decades to our community. If you're in the DC area, there's the Whitman Walker Clinic and there's always Planned Parenthood. Um, Planned Parenthood is a place of, um, of affirming care for our community. Um, again, no large organization is without their issues, but Planned Parenthood does meet its mission 
of providing low cost, accessible sexual and reproductive health care to the community. And they um, have services that are um, LGBTQ plus friendly. So I would take advantage of that as well. So some people will often say, well, what do I need to look for? Um, when, oh, wait, there's a question. Hold on. Let's see, hold on, I gotta move that over. Okay, so um, I will get to that question at the end, asking about what to do if we work with adolescents and um, uh, people, adolescents who might feel unsafe. So I'll do that at the end. Um, so here's the things I look for. I mentioned intake and health history forms. Now within student health, obviously we've, we've changed it. So it's inclusive. I am the worst nightmare of people, um, of practices when I walk in and I look at their uh, intake form. If I don't see um, options for me to give a preferred name, um, ask about my pronouns, even parents. So I'm a mom, I'm a single mom. And every form my child comes home with says mother's name and father's name. Uh, there is no dad. And what if there was another mom? So I am the person who's crossing things off. Okay. Um, if it's saying things like, um, uh, you know, I want to see inclusive language under sexual orientation. So I do want to see heterosexual. I want to see everything. I want to see lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, same gender loving. I want to see non-binary. Um, I want to see everything. I want to see those options. So, um, because it tells me that they're at least aware and they know that when they get that information, we're already setting the stage, right? From the get-go, like, oh, they think about this. They're kind of, you know, they're in the know, they're paying attention. Um, we want to see inclusive language everywhere, um, including in what the providers are using. So, um, I have had people ask me about my husband. No, there is no husband. There is no significant other, okay? So um, the assumption that people make when they see me, and a lot of people make assumptions. I kind of roam around very invisible, right? I'm a white, cisgendered, middle-aged female, okay? So my gender identity matches the physical package it's walking around in. So people are just constantly assuming that I have a Mr. Maresca hanging out at home somewhere. Um, and depending on my feelings of safety, depends on whether or not I correct them and where I am. In healthcare provider offices, I correct them every single time. Um, sexual activity should not only be limited to questions around penetrative penis vagina sex. Um, I would hope that they're asking first, are you sexually active? If yes, can you tell me about the types of sexual activities in which you engage? Okay, are you having vaginal penetration? Are you having anal penetration? Um, is there oral sex that is happening? Um, when this is happening, are you practicing safer sex? Are you using latex barriers? Um, if not, how come? What could we do to get you to move you along that spectrum of possibly using them? I have this um, conversations all the time when I do HIV testing. Um, and when I do HIV testing, like I said, I ask really intrusive questions. So if somebody's telling me that they have multiple partners, that they have sex under the influence of alcohol and other drugs, and they are not using condoms, I'm going to have more conversa conversations with them about what needs to be in place for them to, to maybe make some different choices. Okay, I don't think spending 20 minutes with me, light bulbs are going to go off and people are going to be like, that's it. Like latex is now my middle name and I'm going to use it all the time. But we know that we can make some small changes that will provide some additional protection. STI testing options should be made available regardless of your sexual orientation or your gender identity if you are sexually active. Um, people can have an STI and not know about it. Uh, approximately 50% of um, people with a penis and about 75% of people with a vagina um, don't have any symptoms for chlamydia, which means if they're having unprotected sex with a partner, they're feasibly transmitting this to the partner. And contraceptive options should always be offered as well. And quite often people will say, well, I'm a lesbian, I don't need it. But there are other um, protective factors that come along with contraception. Um, we now know after many years of people flipping out that no, um, somebody, um, a, a person with a vagina does not need to be taken off a of hormonal contraception the minute they turn 35 years old. We now know that even two to three years of using hormonal contraception, even just um, oral contraceptive pills, have other prophylactic or protective qualities. Um, 
that it might reduce our risk for um, certain cancers, endometrial cancers. It might actually reduce risk for breast cancer later in life. Um, it might help with maintaining bone density because we don't go through these huge peaks and valleys of estrogen, no estrogen kind of thing. Um, so the fact that I might not be having sex with someone who can get me pregnant, and now I'm way too old to be pregnant, um, but I can still use hormonal contraceptive because it's protective for me. So those conversations should be had. It shouldn't be like, oh, you, you know, you don't need it kind of thing. Um, that, that bothers me because then to me, they're not seeing us as, as a whole person. So somebody had also asked me about having conversations with, um, with our children. So um, you could probably only imagine how I speak to my child. My son is almost 12 years old. Um, nothing, is, nothing is off limits. He can ask me anything. If we see something, if something I think of, it comes out. Because here's the thing. It's not a one-time conversation. People are still asking about the talk. It's not one talk. This is something that hopefully with, with children in our lives that we have an established relationship with, whether our children, um, my, my, all of my friends' kids um, know that they can ask me questions and their moms and dads know this as well. Um, so I always say, if they ask me, I'm going to answer them, but you need to know this. Okay. Um, so hopefully we're having these conversations from the time they're like th this big. And sometimes those conversations are even as simple as proper names for body parts asking permission to touch someone, even to hug them. I know we all want spontaneous hugs. Well, maybe not during COVID, but the rest of the time. But um, learning that um, they have autonomy over their body, um, learning about consent, learning what their boundaries are, um, understanding it is not who you are by what you do. And also knowing that um, a child will know um, or start to understand their own gender identity as young as three or four years old. So if a three and four year old is, um, you know, we see them as she and they're saying, mm -mm, I'm a he, I'm a he. And then you catch them in the bathroom trying to pee standing up because that's what they saw an older brother or a parent do. Affirm that, affirm that for them um, and let them say, okay, let's, let's explore this. We don't want to shut down. We don't, we want to affirm, not shame. Because I am sure every single one of us in this room has been shamed at least once in our life, either around our sexual orientation, our gender identity, or being sexual people. And the less shame we have and the more affirmation we have, the healthier people we have. And that includes our adolescents as well. So that's a big part of that communication for all of us. Oops, there's the thing. Um, another question I had was things we need to pay attention to. Pay attention to politics. I know they're annoying. I know they're horrifying, but there are bills constantly making their way through um, at state, state level as well as national level. So I just quickly wanted to bring to your attention two things that happened in the state of New Jersey, one almost two years ago and one just this past year. Um, so in 2019, um, in the state of New Jersey, it was established that um, the history of LGBTQ people and stable people should be included in middle school and high school curriculums. Now you may be saying, big what? Um, I know some of our schools are not even doing what they're supposed to be doing in terms of incorporating an inclusive history in terms of Black history, um, Latino, Latina, Latinx history, or Asian American history. We have a very whitewashed history um, that is being taught. But the fact that now they're saying it has to be taught, think what that would have meant to any of us. Um, when we were in middle school or high school to see people like us represented in our classrooms. Um, just this past March, I believe, um, the next bill, S2545, established specific rights and protections for LGBTQIA people, um, including undesignated and non-binary and intersex older adults and people living with HIV in long-term healthcare facilities. Because we could be treated very differently in these places. So it means that they can't, um, uh, they can't like deny um, a, a room change kind of thing. Like I want to be, maybe I have my partner and I, we're now in the same long-term uh, long care facility. I want to be with them. Um, all those kind of things um, to, to affirm us fully in our identities, even as we age, because it doesn't stop. You don't turn 65 and you, you, know, you stop being queer kind of thing. It doesn't work like that. Um, Check out Freedom for All Americans. It's a legislative tracker. It's awesome. It can track um, by issues. 
Um, so you can, you can look at like um, anti-transgender legislation making its way through state legislatures. You could look at religious exemption um, legislation. Um, so right now, New Hampshire is trying to uh, push through a protection of religious liberty. Um, and um, in Texas, they're trying to push through a protection of persons from participation in healthcare service for reasons of conscience. Really? So basically what they're saying is that this goes against my religious beliefs. I don't believe that somebody should be lesbian or gay or bisexual. I don't believe somebody can be transgender. And because it goes against my conscience, I'm not going to provide health care to you. This was floated at the federal level in the last year of um, our prior administrations, our prior administration. Nobody should ever be denied health care. So these are the kind of things we want to look for. Also in Texas, I know I'm picking on Texas. If anybody's here from Texas, I'm so sorry. Um, they're trying to pass a bill about who is authorized to conduct a marriage ceremony and for whom. So it seems innocuous, right? But it's not. It is not innocuous in any way, shape, or form that in 2021, people are still actively trying to legislate away healthcare for LGBTQIA plus people. And many of these laws, actually the bulk of them, I was taking a quick look, are anti-transgender, um, denying medical care, anti-transgender um, student athletes, not being able to use bathrooms, not being able to use locker rooms. Um, and when we see these types of things, the other place I often see these things too is when we do talk about people accessing sexual and reproductive health care. Who can, who should, what kind of services should they get? So these aren't in isolation. Um, there's a larger, definitely a larger issue that we have to think about. Okay, so questions. So there is a question, um, and it is, what do you recommend for those of us working with queer adolescents? Any resources for those who feel unsafe coming out to their parents but have confided in their teacher or counselor? That is a really great question. Um, I would say, do your homework, okay? Um, within, um, if you're working with career adolescents, I'm assuming you might be in a healthcare setting, you might be in a school setting, um, just someplace where you are um, uh, encountering youth. So there's tons of resources out there. Um, one of my favorite resources is Advocates for Youth. It is an amazing um, national advocacy organization that provides resources for youth, for adults, for parents, um, and it's credible resources. Um, so it's, it's really, for me, one of the best places to start. But one of the one things you wanna do when you do work with youth who confided in you, first of all, they trust you, yay you. That's great because it is scary. And if any of us remember what it was like to come out to people, especially as an adolescent, it is completely frightening. Um, so we're gonna thank them for trusting us. Um, we're going to, um, Congratulate them. Good for you for, for understanding this part of your identity because it is confusing and it can be scary, okay? We're gonna ask them if they have any needs that have to be met. So if they're telling you their home is unsafe, is their home unsafe in general, right? Is there other things happening in the home? Is there abuse in the home, whether it's physical or mental abuse? Um, because then that turns into sort of mandatory reporting, okay? Um, anytime um, an adolescent, anybody under the age of 18, if we feel they are at risk or they are being abused in some way, um, we are required to let people know about this. Um, are there groceries in the home? You know, um, if all of that is okay, like everything else is super cool at home and they're like, I'm just really terrified to tell my parents. I've heard my parents say things. One thing I always try to remind people is you need to do what is safest for you. And if the parents are, you know, your source of food and housing and everything else is okay, um, and they're, I don't know, paying for all your sports or your art lessons or whatever, um, you do what you need to do to keep yourself safe in those environments. And can we provide other outlets for you and other connections outside of the home? The fact that we have the, you know, the Google and the worldwide that, um, internet kind of thing, which didn't exist back in my day, um, they can have access to whole communities online or are there other spaces that you could tell them about that they could safely access um, without having to let their parents know. 
Um, so we want to support them in any way, shape, or form that we can. Um, and there, if you are in a confidential um, role of some sort, if you're a healthcare provider, if you are their guidance counselor, um, even if you're their teacher, you're not required to report back to their parents that the student has come out to you. You don't have to tell anybody about this. Um, you just have to support that student in the best way possible. I'm now going to open the chat. Yep, we have a few questions that I have for you. Okay. Uh, so one of the question was, do you see a difference in the level of openness and education in international students versus American students? It depends. It depends um, from where they are coming from. So here's the thing I want to tell you, I'm going to backtrack a little. When it comes to sex education in the United States as a whole, we stink. Okay. Because sex education is um, controlled or mandated by states. Um, and then each state decides what standards have to be met or not met or what could be taught and not taught. And then it is up to individual school districts and how they implement those standards. So if I was going to go back to school and become a teacher um, and I'm going to teach social studies or, or um, do they call it social studies anymore or um, history or math or English language arts, I have to take a praxis to do this to show I have competency and expertise in those areas. We don't have anything like that for sex education. So quite often it is, um, again, if I, you know, even if you want to throw it in the chat, how many of you had your gym teacher as the person who taught you sex ed? Um, maybe some of you had the science teacher or the bio teacher. Um, some of you, if you're on the, on the younger um, side, you might've had teen pep or high tops come into your school. Um, but for most of us, it was a, a gym teacher. So they never necessarily got any training. Um, it was sort of like the short straw. Guess what? You're, you're doing the sex ed module for students. Um, so there's that. But then there's some districts that do a fantastic job. It really just depends on where you are, that they have comprehensive sex education in the schools. It depends on from which country somebody is coming. Um, if you're coming from a place like France or Germany or the Netherlands, they're like, they, to me, they're aspirational for what we want to do. They have comprehensive sex education in schools. Um, their, their approach is um, we respect you and your decisions and your ability to make decisions, and we're going to give you the best tools to make those decisions. They have higher use of contraception at first intercourse and sustained and consistent use of contraception. They have lower rates of unintentional pregnancy, and they have lower rates of STIs and abortion across the board compared to the United States. Other countries um, where it might be more um, uh, conservative um, students might not have um, might not have sex education or comprehensive sex ed, but it doesn't mean that if they're coming here that they're not open to it. Most students are actually very open to it, um, and they're, they're hungry for it. They they want the information. Okay. Great. Um, I'm going to combine two questions. So we had one question was, please repeat the name of the advocacy organization you previously mentioned. And oh. another question was, are there any trainings that could be used for like small businesses or doctor's offices to make them more aware of the needs of LGBTQ uh, community members? And so I needs. just put it, um, I just put it in the chat, chat. It's called Advocates for Youth. Amazing, amazing organization. Okay. Um, in terms of trainings, so this is where it always gets harder for me. I'm so enmeshed in the Rutgers system. So like, I know who to call it Rutgers when I want training. Um, I would say um, there's people who do this work. There's a lot of, there's actually a lot more people like me who work in the rest of the world that we, you know, we're not all confined into university settings. Um, you could probably go through something called um, ASECT which is the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. And people who are ASEC certified have to do all sorts of things to be ASEC certified. So that's always a good resource. Um, again, you could reach out um, through our Center for Social Justice and LGBTQ Communities. They have people who they will say, yeah, well, yeah you should call this person and we'll refer them. Um, some of our own people, you know, they are doing their work outside the university as well. Um, you know, I know amazing, I call them practitioners because as a sex educator, I feel we are practitioners, um, amazing practitioners who, who do this work outside of our work. So like people like me, Elizabeth Amaya Fernandez, 
Um, Lynn Fryer, who's in here, she's a clinician and an amazing educator. Um, there's, um, she just put the Fenway Institute in Boston um, in the chat. Um, that is a great uh, uh, resource. Thank you, Lynn. Um, contact your local LGBTQI community centers. Contact your local Planned Parenthoods. They often have sex educators working within who do education. Um, for uh, training in places like schools, if you want to provide it to students, High Tops and Teen Pep have really good programs. They're peer education. So these are high school students coming to talk to other high school students or coming in and talking to middle school students. They do great work as well. Um, so there's a lot of people who, who do this kind of work and, in, and they do it with businesses too. Um, uh, it's kind of the thing where I know so many people who do it, but not necessarily specific organizations. Anything else? Yep, it looks like we had a question pop in through the Q&A. Uh, any tips for trans people moving from areas like New Jersey and New York to a much more conservative state in terms of receiving gender affirming care, including a hormonal treatment? Would that be sites like Care Dash and One Medical? I would. I would check those out. But I would also say where you're moving to within the state. Okay. So quite often when you move to a state that is deemed conservative, so I'm going to pick on Texas again. So I'll apologize. Like Texas scares me for a whole host of reasons. But if you're living anywhere in the Austin area, like Texas as a whole is conservative. If you're anywhere in Austin, you're gonna find fantastic care because Austin is a really progressive city. So don't only look at the state, look at where you're going to go within the state and then utilize some of those resources. So um, I believe it was said in the chat, but we're going to send you this PDF of today. So you'll get all those links and names as well. So I hope you're not frantically trying to write the I'm saying write things down. I'm a dinosaur. Are you taking pictures of your screen to capture all those links? You don't have to, because you'll get the whole PowerPoint. Okay. Um, find out if there's any local LGBTQ centers. Um, again, you want to connect with community. So they'll be able to say, yes, you know what? We have a list of providers who um, can provide gender affirming care and are um, uh, who are inclusive in their work. Lynn just put in the chat as well, there's an online telehealth platform, Plume Health, um, that provides hormone therapy and will write letters of support for patients. Um, it's a subscription service, um, but it is available in many states, okay? Um, and Kyle put that in the, in the chat as well, so you can all see it. So there's a lot of options. I have to say, the ability to access things online, like even just to do your research is, is um, invaluable, it's priceless. Um, if you know anybody who already lives in that place, um, can you tell me anything that you know about healthcare? Have you had good experiences? Where? Um, that's the kind of thing you want to do. Don't assume because it's a conservative state that all your clinicians or providers are going to be conservative as well, because that is not the case. Um, we often paint with a very broad brush, but there are amazing providers everywhere in this country um, who are who are more than willing to provide really good affirming health care to our community. Okay, we had another question come in. How can we support LGBTQ students at Rutgers? So I'm going to jump in here for a quick second for a shameless plug and talk about Dude. the LGBTQ Student Emergency Fund. It's a fund that is run in conjunction with the Deans of Students Office and the Center for Social Justice Education and LGBT Communities. Uh, when everyone was registering, they should have had a link to uh, give them the availability to donate. If you either missed it or didn't have a chance or are interested now, please feel free to reach out to us and we can get you squared away with that and get you connected with them. And then That's anything awesome. else that you can think of, uh, Dr. Mareska. Yeah, oh my gosh, please don't call me Dr. Mareska. Anyway, um, so yeah, so we have our LGBTQ, um, uh, social justice and LGBTQ center. We have, obviously we have student health. There are amazing student organizations at Rutgers still. If you don't know what they are, you can find them. You can find links to them actually through the SJE website as well. So if a student comes to you and says, you know, I, I would love to meet other people. I mean, like, hey, we have these student orgs and even um, right now we're currently remote, but student organizations are up and functioning and we are anticipating an in-person return in the fall. Um, 
anybody who comes out to you, again, always thank them. Always thank them. You know, it's really funny. Um, I still get nervous when I have to come out to meet people. And I think to myself, how odd is it that I have been out to myself for, I, I don't know how many years now, um, 30, 30 plus years at least. Um, and yet I keep having to do this. And that is the one aspect of me that I have to constantly repeat and come out and come out and come out. And sometimes I worry. I worry about the reaction. I worry, is this a safe place for me to do this? Am I going to get good care? Um, is somebody going to be mean to me? Are bad things going to be happen? And I just want you all to know is that fear, that fear is what keeps people from accessing not just physical health care, but mental health care. It's what keeps people from accessing all sorts of services. Somebody might be worried about going to a food pantry because of this. And that's what we don't want, right? We need to meet people's immediate needs. Maslow, brilliant, right? Um, and when we can meet those needs, and for some people, being part of this community is not their major concern. Being hungry might be their major concern. Being housing insecure might be their major concern. Their uh, mental health, not necessarily related to their, to their sexual orientation or their gender identity might be their bigger concern. So it's a part of us, but it is not all of us. And at different times in our life, it's going to be in different places um, for us. So anytime that somebody trusts us, that we could be a resource, that we could check in with them um, and not always make it about that, but always do that check in. Hey, did, did, you, did, you, um, did you find any of the student orgs on campus? Did you know that there's going to be the fall, I hope, I don't know, the fall opening reception um, that we do every year? Did you know that we have Gabriel, that we have a whole month just of events um, around our community here? Um, check back in, see how they're doing. That's, that's how we support people. Um, and also at Rutgers, I am happy to say that when we went remote, if a student, um, if it was unsafe for a student to return to their home, from a residence hall because of homophobia or transphobia, transphobia, they were housed on campus. We did provide housing for them. We also know that we have um, students who are housing insecure who also happen to be part of the community. They remained in our housing as well um, because we know it is not, not everybody can just go home. Um, and I always usually like to ask students, is there anybody who is supportive in their circle? And it might not be a parent, but it might be an aunt, it might be a cousin, um, it might be any number of people. Um, so it, hope, it helps if we could um, say to them, is there anyone who is supportive of you? Um, and to see how can, how can we support everybody? Um, we can do that, we can definitely do that. Okay, and I think that is about all the time that we have. So I did just want to toss a event flyer up on the screen. So this is the next event for our Pride Month series events. We're going to have a virtual queer trivia night. So uh, details to follow on that. But right now, I can just have that up as they save the date. It's going to be Tuesday, June 29th from 6 to 7.30. Uh, registration will be available both on the Rutgers University uh, Alumni Association website, as well as we're going to send that out to everyone who registered for today's event. Uh, we also did definitely want to thank Dr. Francesca Maresca for all of her time today, for the great presentation, for answering all of our questions. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure, really. This is probably like the best hour I've spent all week. So thank you. And I hope everybody is um, staying as safe as possible and as well as possible. And if you have not yet been vaccinated for COVID, I am going to um, highly encourage you to access the COVID vaccine as well. Great. And once again, thank you everyone for attending. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Yeah, take care everyone, bye-bye.